And here I was anticipating you gentlemen, well-bred gentlemen, being prepared for the classroom, sitting down when you're ready. <laughs> and you should have gone hands on heads. <laughs> <laughs> What's that? Bye, please. <laughs> I've asked Miss Chaves to come here today, but I've asked her to leave her cane at home. Oh, oh, oh. I have asked. So you guys, you, you guys can all wipe your wax tablets and sharpen your pencils and take notes because there will be questions afterwards. <laughs> Welcome Miss Chaves, the principal of our, what I think is a, a fabulous new secondary college in, in our area. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but it's not only bricks and mortar, you know, it's all about, you know, A, the school, the people in it, the facilities around it and We've probably all seen uh, Bo Morris High School as it was degrade into a a wreck, and now out out of for want of a better term, out of the ashes we've got this, and we've got Miss Chaves all the way from America. Just a short time ago, twenty seven years. years ago. Yeah. We might let her stay for a while. <laughs> uh, and and so uh, we welcome you, and we we hope to uh, glean a little bit of what the difference is between the wax tablet and the schools we have today. Mr. Jones, thank you. So, um, thank you so much for inviting me. It's uh, quite an honor to be speaking in front of uh, a group of gentlemen who, between you, had many, many years of experience but also education. So hopefully uh, this will give you an opportunity in seeing what you probably have learned from your grandchildren and your children in terms of how education has started to shift um, and why it started to shift. Is there anybody here who went to Beaumaris High School or worked at Beaumaris High School back in the day? So the original Beaumaris High School started in 1958 and they actually uh, didn't finish building it till 1959 so they were housed at the uh, Beaumaris Yacht Club and the Methodist Church for classes in that first year. And so 60 years later, in 2018, uh, Bomaris High School, renamed as Bomaris Secondary College, uh, was reborn. And reborn to 154 uh, students and families who, with no teachers, no buildings completed, um, nothing but me and my traveling road show telling them what school was going to look like, um, came to the college. And so, Next year, we're going to have 185 students, and we're actually going to have three year levels, year seven, eight, and nine, and so we're gonna have 534 students. Now those two buildings that you see over there actually are supposed to house 650. Um, when the state government looked at rebuilding the school, um, after much community support, and obviously Clark Martin, uh, the mayor for Bayside, was instrumental along with uh, our council president, Steve Pierce, in pushing uh, for the Andrews government to do something about uh, state education in the Beaumaris suburb and not let it die off. Uh, and it's sort of that idea of, if you build it, they will come, Kevin Costner style, Field of Dreams, and they have. And I think the state government's quite surprised with the number of students who have actually come back into the state system. It's extraordinary. I was expected to have uh, 80 students. I was told, in your first year, Debbie, you'll be lucky to let 80 students you'll have. And I said, all right, challenge on. I'm going for 100. We had 250 students request a place in that first year and 154 uh, who were within the boundary. Our boundary is a two and a half kilometer radius. And we share it with one of the three all-girls government schools in the state. So to have uh, a split of 60% boys, 40% girls, a kilometer away from one of the, other one of the three state schools that uh, are single sex for girls, and the number of Catholic and independent schools that are single sex as well is pretty extraordinary. So I'm quite proud of the community, uh, I suppose, embracing and supporting uh, this new school. 
We have 41 fantastic, talented staff and teachers, um, and our parent community, second to none, uh, every event we have um, is unbelievable. We have just about every 80 to 90 percent of parent attendance at every school event. I can say to you, being in education uh, in Australia now for the 27 years I've been here, uh, I've never had that level of parent engagement, so it's pretty extraordinary. Um, we also have a very special agreement with our shared use agreement with the Melbourne uh, Cricket Club and one that how many people are MCC members in here so you would have seen it in your newsletter as well we're in there uh, regularly um, December 4th there's actually going to be a T20 big bash game at the school at 515 uh, for those of you who are interested hopefully we'll get some information up and about uh, for the community so that's exciting I suppose for, it's important to note that that's a shared use agreement. That's Department of Education land. MCC doesn't own that land. They share the use of it. And what a great community facility to have until 4.30 every day, schools using that facility in any way they like, uh, a, a northern oval that's about seven meters uh, smaller than the MCG, and a southern oval that I still haven't gotten the measurements of, but that isn't that much smaller that the MCC women's team, uh, AFL team, plays on, and that's their home ground, along with a FIFA-grade multi-purpose pitch that is 100 meters by 68 meters. And so local clubs are using it, as well as MCC clubs. So it's a really exciting space for our students, and if you've never had the chance it is not a dog walking area, but certainly feel free <laughs> to come onto the grounds because the grounds aren't closed. It's a community ground and we would want our young people in the community kicking a footy or a soccer ball. Um, the multi-purpose pitch actually is closed. The reason that's closed is because the surface is an artificial surface and requires quite a bit of maintenance and um, obviously we want sort of different use for that. So, uh, but the two ovals, uh, it's nicer than most carpets and, and homes, that grass. Um, the quality of it is probably one of the top uh, playing grounds for, certainly for cricket uh, in the state. And uh, an international game was played there, I think during last school holidays, and they were quite impressed and have actually tried to get a lot more games on that ground now because they realized just how good it was. So our school developed I suppose their their vision for what they wanted based on this community. Um, and so to be part of Omaris, you have that sense of wanting to belong. You belong to this village, to this community that cares about each other. I mean, in the weekend's age, they talked about the low crime rate, the accessibility to schools, you know, the proximity to the beach, the um, natural environment that surrounds Beaumaris. And that's really something special and having a boundary that's so small where of the 350 students we currently have at school uh, I would say about 200 ride their bikes to school and the other 120 uh, are walking with friends and I'd say the others are still getting rides from mom and dad and we're trying to discourage that but what you're seeing is truly a community school back to I think you know that time where everybody went to their local school and everybody rode and everybody walked and it was safe and it was comfortable to do. And I think that, that sense of belonging in Beaumaris is so important. I suppose the values that come from that, the high expectations, the, the sense of um, what it means to be part of a, a community, um, kindness. Um, really, I wanted to set up, I think schools are many worlds. And you know, people often use that comment, wait till you get out into the real world. No, <coughs> schools are the real world. And it's what we do in schools that makes the real world that we live in. And to say that there is something separate, I think, is actually really wrong. We want our many worlds in schools to be a place of kindness, of high expectations, of places where we learn to treat each other with um, respect. And where you, we learn how to contribute to the world we're going to enter as adults. That's really what school needs to be about and that sense of who we become and becoming their best selves on that journey, whatever that looks like for those young people. And I think that's really important in terms of the mission that we set, belonging, believing, becoming your best selves. 
So then those core values, and I know you can't see it up here, but the core values is an acronym for curiosity, optimism, respect, and excellence. So we had to think about what do we want our school to be? I really found it extraordinary in the 20 plus years of being in education. Now, I will say this, this is about as Australian as I'm gonna sound. And to my family, I sound really Aussie, right? So whenever I talk to people in the States, I do. I married an Australian, which is what brings you out here oftentimes. Um, and so when I thought about the world that I wanted to live in in Australia, and the education shift that I saw in the 20 plus years, I saw students apologizing for asking questions. They would be coming up to you going, sorry miss, but can I ask a question? Sorry, can I ask, sorry. At what point, and where did it happen, I don't even know where it happened as an educator, that young people apologized for being curious. There should be no apology for asking questions. It should be part and parcel for what it means to be a lifelong learner. And so our young people, they ask questions, and I want them to be curious, curious which is why <coughs> curiosity is one of our core values first and foremost. <coughs> Optimism, I want to go to a place where people are happy to be every day. I want to be smiling, saying hello, looking up, not on their phones, not looking down, being part of the world around them, smiling at the trees as the wind blows through them. We are in a beautiful place and optimism needs to be central to that. I also want to be in a place where respect is about how we treat each other. It is about how human beings interact in general. That the way that you treat others is the way that you get treated. And then of course, excellence, meaning that I want all of those students to achieve their personal best and excellence looks different for every single one of them. So, what's the world that, and I know you can't see it as clearly, but um, one of the biggest changes is in the recent growth and demand of certain types of skills that have completely shifted in our modern world. And those really sit around digital skills, creative problem solving skills, interaction skills, and so when we look at what skills our young people have to have in order to be successful in the current workplace uh, that they're moving into, and this is based on career, uh, jobs and careers that have been advertised, what you have is digital, that, the largest 212% digital literacy. The growth in jobs related to digital literacy has grown by 212%. Critical thinking within jobs, 158%. Creativity, 65%. And then what's really interesting is down towards that lower and that 7% is financial literacy. Because what you have are computer programs in that digital space doing a lot of the work that traditionally was done by accountants, if there are any accountants in here, I'm very sorry, um, and by a number of other uh, roles that no longer exist because they're being taken over by that di digital literacy uh, space. Communication skills are a big important part of what skills young people need, um, but digital literacy, it's extraordinary. So when we talk about young people needing to understand digital literacy, we're not talking about them being on social media and we're not talking about them understanding programs um, like uh, you know Instagram or any of the others that are out there, it actually sits around using the tools that are available in that online space. And I can tell you for a school that uses uh, technology as a tool, computers are no longer fun to our students because they see them as work. It replaced, we have virtual, uh, a virtual online space, virtual notebooks for our students. And back in the day when you had exercise books and you were writing in, the devices they now have are touch screen and stylus. And so they actually have Pull that stylus out. They actually have styluses that resemble pens and they write on their screens. And they do mathematics in that way. And they do their English in that way. And do we still use pen and paper? Of course we do. But we also know that a large component of the work that they're going to move into, regardless of whatever pathway they choose, will also sit around their understanding of digital literacy skills. 
And so our students, um, and I'll talk about some of the technology that they're actually learning um, that has a very practical application as well as um, a more uh, creative application. When you look at critical thinking, what we try to achieve with the way we've designed teaching and learning at Beaumaris really ties into that um, pretty strongly. So here's the thing that's really different about uh, the school. Has it, how many people have actually been to the building itself and walked around on community day? Anyone that was there? Yeah. So if you ever get a chance when we do have sort of community days, feel free uh, and open nights to come through and um, have a walk through because it's a school like no other. Um, we've had visitors from all over uh, the world right now who've come through and we actually have a group from North Carolina who want to see how we use our learning spaces and tie it to our natural environment. But that takes a lot of work. It means you can't, it's not four walls and a door. It's not a teacher at the front, sage on the stage. Um, it's not uh, that sense of um, you're in your own little island as an educator anymore. The spaces define what teaching and learning looks like and as a result, teaching and learning has to change. And it has. So we might move to, so this is going to be a video. And what you're going to see is just a walkthrough. There's no voiceover or anything. But it's simply a walkthrough of what our school looks like for with students in it, learning, experiencing. So that's our lab. It's our visual arts space. Our students actually chose, were part of a working party to choose the furniture that populates the school. <laughs> so there's tiered seating, round tables, conference tables, standing height tables, soft seating. Are there any classrooms as we used to know? Um, the, this is the closest that comes to it. So our students wouldn't know the experience that you had in school based on what you're seeing here. This is their reality and this is the, the type of learning experience that... That looks the same though, doesn't it? <laughs> All right, so you get a sense, you get a sense of just how different it is and how you can't you know, you're right. It, it, you, you can't teach in the same way. You, learning doesn't happen in the same way. The way that you approach things doesn't. But then, if you think back to a traditional room where you had rows and a teacher at the front, if digital literacy plays a part in that teaching and learning, how does a teacher walk up and down that classroom space to actually see what our students are doing on their devices? So the reality is they've changed because of the type of learning and what we're needing to learn has changed. And because it's changed, the spaces have changed. So it really reflects what we're wanting for our young people. Now, you can't change things without changing the language. So yes, I've probably complicated it a little bit because I wanted it to relate to students in a very different way. And I'm gonna tell you the most pushback that I get is from our, um, our parents who are used to something more traditional. So at the center of, do you mind going back one? I just wanna, is that, oh sorry, no. Yeah, the one that had, is there one, no? That's all right. So we've got 
at the center of what we do, we might go to the next one. That's it, that's the one. Beautiful, thank you. So if you look at those, those are actually the learning areas that we have. Now at the center of all of that, we've got a learning area called Innovate. Innovate is where you develop the technical skills to apply and all of the other, to actually, where you incorporate the knowledge, skills, and content from all of the other learning areas into creating something new. Hence why it's called Innovate. And it's where you'd use the laser cutter, the 3D printer, the, um, we've got a CNC router. Has anybody used a CNC router before, which does 3D? Yeah, so we've got a beautiful CNC router um, at the school. Uh, and normally a student wouldn't access a CNC router unless they went to a TAFE environment. And so for our students, they're learning the technical skills that sit behind design so that they can apply it and they create something real and tangible. But in order to do that, you have to have a real um, strong understanding of the different learning areas. Now, all these learning areas came from um, what is it that you're actually having to do with it? When you go home and you read a novel, or you write an email, or you make a phone call, you're not doing English. You don't actually turn to somebody else and say, oh, I better get to my English now as an adult. So we spend a lot of time complaining that young people don't relate what they've learned to the real world. Well, why would they? English isn't the real world. That's the subject, that's the content, skills and knowledge that they learn. They learn it so that they can communicate and relate in the real world. So what do we call our English-based subject? Communicate and relate, because that's why you're learning the skills, content, and knowledge. 